Hi, I'm Pastor John Fleming. I'm here to welcome you to worship with the people of the Open Door Churches, the United Methodists of Salem, Kaiser, Oregon. Will you pray with me? God, we delight in your creation. We thank you for soft breezes, crisp apples, and changing seasons that remind us of your presence and provision. God, we delight in our connectedness. We thank you for friends who check in, for church family who lift one another up, for neighbors who show up in the good and challenging times. God, we delight in your peace that dwells among us. We give thanks for neighbors who offer help in times of trouble, gentleness in the midst of pain, and acts of kindness during seasons of struggle. Help us to keep these things in the forefront of our thoughts as we worship you this day. Amen.
Friends, as we gather our hearts and our minds for this time of prayer, I do want to remind you that we value your trust in us as a community of faith. And if you have a prayer of joy or concern that you would share with us so that we may be with you in your times of difficulty and challenge or celebrate with you in your times of joy, we invite you to email those prayer requests to info at opendoorchurches.org. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all that you have been for us, for all that you have done for us, and for all of the things that you have given to us as stewards. As we pause this week to give thanks, we recognize that you are the source of all things that what we hold in our possession does not really belong to us, but instead comes from you and returns to you. We pass through this world, and we look forward to eternity. But while we walk this earth, we know that you call us to live a life of thanksgiving. May that not just be something we do once a year, but every day and even in every moment. Thanksgiving is not simply a holiday. It is a point of view. It is a life orientation that allows us to see our place in your creation, to see what you have called us to do, and also to lift others up, to share the good news that must be good news for everyone. And so, Lord, we thank you, especially for what we have seen in Jesus, your anointed one, your servant, the one who has come to lead us into life, and the one who taught his disciples to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. This week comes from Matthew chapter 25. I'll be reading verses 14 through 30. Listen now for the word of God. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents had made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. 
His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who, with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you are a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents, for all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, are you familiar with the term ROI? I'm not a business person, so I didn't pick it up through any education or even experience. But I can remember the exact moment where I learned the meaning of that term. In fact, I can even remember who I was with. I was at a trivia night at a pub in Dallas, Texas. And I know it was over 20 years ago because I was with my good friend, Clay Andrew, who lives here in Oregon and uh, hasn't lived in uh, Texas for a very long time. The, the term ROI, as I learned from listening to the answer to a trivia question, <laughs> means return on investment. As in, what's the expected return on the investment in this venture? Um, one of the things that we can learn from today's scripture is that people have been concerned about ROI since long before it became a familiar shorthand for wondering whether something was worth investment, investing money, time, or energy in. Though it's primarily a term used when somebody is, is specifically interested in the outcome of financial investment, I've heard and have used uh, ROI when talking about all kinds of ventures. And you know I'm a church professional, so I'm using that term, if I'm using that term, it's certainly not because I'm looking for a profit, or at least one that is divided among shareholders. When I use the term, especially in a church setting, I'm talking about whether we can expect to have some kind of measurable outcome from the resources that we are investing in a ministry or a project. When we're talking about a financial investment someone is making and expecting a return on that investment, they are usually hoping to have more money after they make the investment than they did before they made the investment. But in a church setting, it can be more difficult to track ROI. It can be a question about numbers, but it can also be something much more subjective, like did people grow spiritually? One thing I've come to understand about church, however, is that we are often reticent to invest our resources, uh, whether those are time or money, if we aren't absolutely clear that there is a return on the investment, something measurable. And we want to know what that return might be even before we are willing to invest in it, ourselves in it. Uh, this year, we've seen this unfold a little bit, uh, at, um, at Salem First United Methodist Church uh, in, our, um, in our identification of three objectives that we hope to make measurable outcomes on in the year 2024. And those objectives came uh, from our strategic plan and, uh, and they are shared as, uh, as these potential areas where we see, hope to see some growth. Uh, throughout my ministry, I've heard people 
usually in finance committee, just saying, <laughs> who have said something to the effect that the church is a business. And if you want, I could show you on my outline here that the, at the end of that quote, there are multiple exclamation points because that's almost invariably the way that I, it, it, those comments have come across to me. And, and I have to say, I have a, 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 a fair measure of, a, of belief that I understand what that means. And, and some sympathy for that point of view. The church has a financial bottom line that cannot be ignored just because our work is based on faith. And when I say faith, what I mean is something that Paul talked about. Faith is something that is unseen, not what is seen. And so keeping these things in mind, let's just look for a moment at the parable that Jesus tells in this passage. One thing to keep in mind is that not all the servants in the parable are entrusted with the same gifts. Now I'm just going to say, uh, as I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm using this word gifts so that I'm not really sure is exactly the right word there because the servants are entrusted with something that does not belong to them. It's not given to them. It is entrusted to them, but it belongs to someone else. And the story specifically mentions this, each according to his ability. The owner of the talents has an idea of what the three servants are capable of accomplishing. He knows that there's some reason to entrust one with five times as much as the other person, as another one. Another thing to remember is that there's no expectation mentioned specifically by the owner of the talents before he leaves. He simply entrusts the talents to them. And on the other hand, he may not have needed to mention that what his expectations might be because they apparently knew him very well. Um, and it may be that he didn't need to tell them what his expectations were that that had been communicated through a relationship and through previous experience. Um, it certainly is the way it seems to me, at least from the perspective of the, the third servant, the one that was entrusted with the one talent. Uh, he sees the owner as harsh and even as someone who gathers where he has not even been the one to sow. Um, so what can we learn from this? Uh, this story about the nature of God and our relationship with God. Uh, if you've if you've been a United Methodist for a very long time, like I have, you may remember um, there was a famous uh, Christian educator uh, in the United Methodist tradition, Dick Murray, and he formulated these three questions: What does this story tell us about God? What does this story tell us about human beings? And what does this story tell us about the relationship between God and human beings? And so I'm thinking about those questions, and I'm, I, and I'm looking at this story, a story that I have preached on before multiple times. Uh, I, I was talking with one of the church members at Salem First recently about the passage, and they said, I never liked this scripture. And I'm going to say that I kind of get that. I don't mind it so much until we get to that end part where, uh, where the master... Uh, uh, you know, is so harsh toward the the servant that had the one talent. Um, this clearly is not the first time that the master has had this kind of relationship with the servant, which is part of the reason why he only gave him the one talent instead of the five. Um, but he was still giving him a chance, correct? And, and the thing is that... It, um, even though there's this this harshness to that, um, we we still see that the master is willing to give uh, to give praise and grace and and invest in someone, even if he thinks that he may not be successful at it. Um, it's not so much who the master is; it's who the servant is and how the servant relates to the master. Someone who is m much more concerned, it seems to be that he's much more concerned about keeping what he has, this, this you know, protective kind of way of relating to things rather than, um, than investing himself in, in 
in what is going on. So, uh, you know, is is this the same God? <laughs> I mean, I, I when I read this this judgmental kind of or this harsh response, I just I wonder: is it it's the same God that has been willing to grant me me personally incredible grace all my life? Even in those ways where I've been one who sort of buried what God had entrusted to me. So I think, especially after reading some commentaries about this passage, what, I, what I'd like to say, um, and these are not exactly my thoughts, although I'm sharing what I think about what I read, that first we have to break out of the thinking that this is a story uh, about gifts that God has given to us. Uh, things that we possess, in a sense, um, at least not in the way that we often talk in the church about having gifts and talents that that we cultivate. I've talked a lot about this over the last several weeks because uh, I've been talking about all the things that God has entrusted to us, including our our financial resources. But um, this story isn't so much about smaller things like that. Um, this is about enormous things, highly valuable things. And this was something that I remember from uh, long ago, but I, I confirmed in some reading this week. A talent was not something that a person can do well, at least not in this story it's not. It, the talent was a specific measure of wealth, 6,000 denarii. And the denarii was the daily wage for a day laborer. And and 6,000 denarii was equivalent to 20 years' wages for a day laborer. So you see, this is a vast amount of money that even the servant with the least ability was trust entrusted by the master with this highly valuable gift or something that was entrusted to him. And you know, God has entrusted this person with that, and, and his first reaction is not to think about what could be done with that, but instead to think about his relationship with, with the owner of the talent. Another way to look at this parable might be to think about that relationship. Not so much about the value of the gift or what the people do with it or even what the response of the of the owner of the talents is but to think about how two of the two of those servants seem to have this trusting relationship they're willing to go out and to use that that uh, money that has been entrusted to them in productive ways and that's because in some sense they trust the owner of the talents. And the third clearly doesn't. When I think about what that means for us as the church, for instance, I, I think about all of the resources that we have. And recently, uh, Pastor Jenny and Pastor Kift and I participated in uh, this seminar called Housing God's Beloved. And, and in that, we were encouraged all of us, not just the three of us, but all of us who are part of United Methodist congregations all over Oregon and Idaho and up into the Pacific Northwest Conference, we were encouraged to be thinking about resources like this, resources that we have in trust that, that have been given to the church in some sense in order to cultivate, to cultivate uh, in this particular case as Bishop Cedric Bridgeforth talks about ministry that matters. Not to protect them, not to hold them tightly, but to invest them in something that really matters. And when we do this, when we do this, what do we hear from the Lord, the one who we have pledged to serve? But well done, good and faithful good and faithful servants. You have, you have done much with what I have given you. I will give you much more. 
welcome into the joy of your master. Friends, this is what we hope for the church, isn't it? That if we utilize the resources, not for our own protection or, or, or not so that we can hold on them to them, but if we invest them in the future, then, then the return will come. But if we hold on to them tightly, if we refuse to invest them in ministries that matter, then can we really blame ourselves for, or can we really blame God for what, what we see as the church pulls back and, and uh, doesn't engage in the community around us? That's my hope. My hope is that we will indeed invest in ministries that matter, that we will be bold in that way, that we will be unafraid. Because you see, that's the driving factor of the slave that refused to invest the money, that buried in the ground, because he was so afraid. Fear is, is something that often drives us can drive us to action or it can drive us to inaction. Um, what should drive us is love. A love for God and a willingness to take risks and to not be driven by fear, but be driven by compassion for others and our love for God. In the name of the Creator and of the Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't go to church on Sunday There might be wisdom in those walls and Long ago I got fed up with the institution I couldn't relate at all When I go to work on Monday, I close my eyes and pray. I pray God uses me to be an inspiration to those I'm worshiping with today. Concrete sanctuary bus stop views on the city streets. A throwaway congregation that's church to me. Some folks have this crazy idea poor people take, but have nothing to give. I know firsthand it's not true. I've been blessed 14 years, millions of conversations. But folks on the outside look rough. Deep down are just like me and you A concrete sanctuary Bus stop pews on the city streets A throwaway congregation That's church to me I had a streetwise education Confirmation class unlike what I've ever seen I came here offering salvation and Through these beautiful people God made a change in me A concrete sanctuary 
bus stop pews on the city streets a throwaway congregation it's church to me It's always my privilege to be able to thank you for the generosity that you, that you, with which you support the ministries of the Open Door Churches and each one of our congregations. I, I would like to share some news with you. Over the past um, month, there have been times when we have been able to participate in collective learning experiences that have enriched the lives of those who have, uh, who have been a part of them and have called us to be in deeper ministry with the community around us. Um, on the first week of November, uh, Pastor Jenny and I and others from the Open Door Churches participated in, uh, in a summit in Portland called Housing God's Beloved. It was an opportunity for us as people of the Oregon-Idaho Conference of the United Methodist Church to think about what it might be like if churches stepped forward to provide affordable housing for people. It's a grand calling, but as one of those who spoke talked, she said that we must just do what we can do. We're stepping forward in faith and exploring opportunities to do that. And your giving is what allows us to be in places like that. So on behalf of the entire Open Door Church community and the communities of Salem and Kaiser, I thank you. Will you pray with me? All things come from you, O God. And with gratitude, we return to you what is yours. In gratitude for all your gifts, we offer ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us, that peace may take shape in all the earth. Amen. Friends, as we get ready to close our time of worship for this week, I do want to remind you about a special event that's happening soon at one of our churches, the one that I'm in right now, Salem First United Methodist Church on the first weekend of December, uh, on uh, that weekend on Saturday and Sunday, there will be uh, our annual alternative Christmas market, an opportunity for you to step outside of the traditional ways of celebrating Christmas giving and to think about what it might be like if instead of simply buying things that uh, that fit a particular person that we, um, that we love. Uh, we use some of our buying power in order to support different kinds of ministries. Everything from fair trade products to, uh, to, uh, to local organizations that help those in need. It's an opportunity for you to do that. So I hope that you'll join us here at Salem First uh, so that we can support the community together. Would you pray with me? May the love of God lift all, us, all of us up so that we indeed may lift up one another, thinking not about what we receive from it, but instead about what we give. Amen.